This whole program I put together in hopes of creating a dialogue with the federal agencies and I thought the first way to start that off after Jesse's great introduction to what games are good at is to have a representative from the ESA, the Entertainment Software Association, come and speak with us about the state of the industry. Today we have the Vice President of Governmental Affairs for the ESA here, Eric Huey, and I want to thank him for his time in advance. And everyone, here is Eric. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, Ossie and Michelle, for uh, inviting ESA uh, to be here. As Susan mentioned, I'm uh, Eric Huey. I'm the Senior Vice President of Government Affairs for the Entertainment Software Association. And we, as the video game industry, are thrilled to be here uh, at, at Games for Change, uh, a group we're proud to be involved with, not only as the uh, ESA, but also through our foundation. Uh, I'm speaking today. Our President and CEO, Mike Gallagher, is uh, giving a uh, keynote, the penultimate remarks, on Wednesday afternoon and introducing Lucy Bradshaw, uh, uh, one of the Vice Presidents of, of uh, Electronic Arts, EA, one of our largest member companies, and uh, her studio is the uh, brainchild behind uh, such titles as Sims, SimCity, and Social, Sim Social, uh, which has exploded onto the Facebook platform with 60 million new viewers. Um, to give you a little background on the Entertainment Software Association, uh, we are the trade association for the video game industry. Uh, if you think of what NCTA, NCTA is to the cable industry or CTIA is to the wireless industry or the MPAA is to the movie industry, we are that to the video game industry. We have over 36 uh, member companies. A lot of them are household names. A lot of them you know uh, extraordinarily well. Uh, all from, from very large companies to, to some, some smaller uh, mom and pop uh, companies that are growing into, into larger companies. We run a global anti-piracy campaign. We run the government affairs apparatus of the entire industry. We run the public relations apparatus of the, of the industry. And we uh, protect our uh, members' uh, intellectual property through our legal and, and policy departments. And we were also the name plaintiff in the Brown versus EMA ESA uh, landmark Supreme Court decision that came out almost exactly one year ago today that established and affirmed the First Amendment right of video games and gave them the equal protection of all other art, music, literature, um, movies, and established video games as a, uh, it gave us a, a stripe of legitimacy, as you will, and said no government can act in, 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 a, in an arrangement of prior restraint to come in and restrict our abilities to distribute our games uh, in, in, through the ESRB uh, rating system. So who are we as an industry? Of course, you remember the, <coughs> the early days. I don't have to tell you that this is sort of where we came from, the days of <coughs> Pong, where we're on our 40th anniversary, or to, if you go back even further to the, to the very first video game, uh, some would say the 50th anniversary. I know the Museum of the Mo Moving Image is doing uh, an installation later this year to celebrate the 50th anniversary. The Smithsonian currently has uh, the history and art of the video game installation in Washington, D.C. You remember Pong? You remember Pac-Man, of course, and uh, Mario Brothers, uh, Super Mario, what a career that guy's had. He's uh, got his start there in Donkey Kong. This is, this is who we are now. We have Skyrim, which was game of the, uh, the year last year, Assassin's Creed, uh, which just had a great debut at E3, which is our trade show uh, in Los Angeles that we'll talk a little <laughs> bit more about and uh, Battlefield 3, and we're also, uh, we're, we're moving around. The old days of the static console that is not interconnected uh, to the rest of the world, where you have to sit on your couch and only play games with the people in the room are, are long gone, as, as, as you know. Just to give you some stats on the industry, we are a $25 billion industry here in the U.S. That is as large, if not larger, than the d domestic box office gross of Hollywood paired with the music industry. So you take kind of domestic Hollywood, the music industry, put them together, that's about the same size of, of, of our industry. We are a $66 billion industry worldwide. Um, when you think about the interactivity and the inter interconnectivity of, of, of our industry, this is the moment where our industry really took off. When you could go from playing games to with, with the people in the room to playing games with people around the world. We now have 40 million people who pay 
each month to subscribe to Xbox Live. There are over 90 million people worldwide on Sony's PlayStation Network. Uh, the mobile gaming industry, which we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, had $8 billion in sales in 2011, and 67% of households have video game uh, consoles. When you think about the, the depth and the breadth and the reach of, of, of our industry, it's interesting to just take a look at one single title, Call of Duty M Modern Warfare 3. Call of Duty is, is an amazing franchise um, that Activision has. Three years in a row, it's sold over $1 billion worldwide. Uh, it's sold 6.5 million units in the uh, UK and US within its first 24 hours. Uh, it grossed $1 billion in 16 days. It took 16 days to do it. It took Avatar 17 days. So it is the largest, enter the largest debut in entertainment history. Um, and it uh, has three years in a row of opening, opening day records. If you look at kind of the, the chart of the growth of, of this industry, a couple of interesting things you'll see. Uh, meteoric growth, uh, sort of an industry that has, um, that has tripled, if not quintupled, over the last uh, 10 or 12 years and doubled in size during the Great Recession. Um, we had 5.5 billion in sales in 2000, when you go, when you go to uh, the current year, or 2010, what you'll see is something interesting. The actual sale of computer games, the, the shrink-wrapped discs, has gone down somewhat. However, the, the trend line continues to increase when you uh, combine dollars for uh, digital games, subscriptions, add-on content, mobile apps, social network gaming. This includes the Facebook platform. So that sort of light purple line is going to continue to grow and we expect the growth chart to uh, continue upwards uh, indefinitely, uh, we hope, into the future. Um, who plays these games? The, uh, the old adage of the uh, acne-laden teenager in, in his parents' basement is long gone. Now, we know that 91% of U.S. children aged 2 through 17 play games, uh, but 42% of all players are women. And in fact, women over the age of 18 are the industry's, uh, one of the industry's fastest growing demographics. In 2010, over 20% of gamers are over the age of 50, which is an incredible statistic when you think, well, what caused that? Certainly the, the advent of the Wii, the Microsoft Connect, Sony PlayStation, and the Move uh, helped to, to fuel that. And 40% of American parents play video games with their children weekly. So we like to uh, think that we are reimagining the, uh, the American living room. We are the new electronic hearth around which families of all generations are gathered, not just parents, but grandparents when they're uh, with their grandchildren. And it's interesting, when we go to Capitol Hill and we talk to, uh, and we talk to elected officials, Many of them, if they're under 45, which is an increasing number of them, grew up as gamers. Uh, and then you have this donut hole, and then you have sort of people over 60, 65, who now play uh, the Wii and Connect and PlayStation Move with their grandkids. So it's an, it's an amazing transformation in terms of our demographics, but it also in terms of the demographics of policymakers, and that's evidenced, uh, that's evidenced today here uh, by the, the uh, representation, strong representation, brought together by Constance uh, Squire of the White House and the, the Federal Gaming uh, Guild. Uh, we talked about the new consoles that make all of this all of this possible, and now I'd like to talk a little bit. Um, these are the consumers. Uh, a little bit about about where this where this is going. We think uh, traditionally of of the of the consoles, and you either play it on a Sony or a Microsoft uh, Xbox, Sony PlayStation, or a Nintendo uh, Wii. Now you have all of these various platforms. You've got the Apple App Store, and 80% of the uh, apps on the App Store are, store are games, including seven of the top 10 best sellers. Facebook is a tremendous new and powerful new platform. As I mentioned, as I opened, SimSocial went up to 60 million users and be became the number two game in, uh, uh, in all of Facebook within one month of, of, of being launched. So that's a powerful new platform. Wherever you go, whatever device you use, whether it's a smartphone or a tablet or a feature phone or the consoles, gaming can follow you. And our, our uh, member companies are ensuring that the game you start on your console in the morning, move to your tablet on your commute, move to your start phone throughout the day, you can come back to on the console and have a seamless gaming experience. That's the future and that's where we are uh, going. So 
what we're going to see is increased social interaction, uh, community building around games, and e an ecosystem of interconnected users. When you think of the ecosystem around games like um, w World of Warcraft, uh, Jay McGonigal uses, uses a stat that's about a year and a half old, but I think it's, it, it, it's only grown since then, that in World of Warcraft, there have been six million years of play. In, in one single game of, of World of Warcraft. When you look at any of our titles, uh, Battlefield 3, Call of Duty, some of the largest titles, FIFA, there are online game play numbers that are absolutely uh, staggering. That is only going to increase. It's human nature to want to connect to one another, and games, uh, games enable that uh, in a, in a, in a, in a futuristic, interactive way, and in a way that's more engaging than ever before, uh, fueled by the technology advances and the graphics. Uh, as I mentioned, seven of the top ten games are, are apps. Angry Birds has been downloaded 140 million <laughs> times. Uh, the free version earns a million dollars a month from, from advertising. And Angry Birds is an interesting example. We talk about Angry Birds a lot when we go out to schools. Uh, because this, these, are, these are three or four guys in Finland in a garage with, the, with an idea, and it was their 52nd game that they, 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 they tried. So what we tell people is no geographic area has a monopoly on creativity. Austin, Texas, Silicon Valley, the places, Los Angeles, Seattle, the places you would uh, ordinarily, New York City, ordinarily think of uh, as, as the creative epicenters of ours and other industries, through gaming, you're not limited to that. If you've, got an, if you've got an idea and a broadband connection, you can take your idea to the world, and it could be the next, uh, the, the next Angry Birds. Um, games are now just a ser are now a service, not a static product. The old days of shrink wrap it, ship it, and forget it are long over. Uh, we, uh, as an industry, interface with our users on a monthly, a weekly, and a daily basis. We provide constant updates to our games, so we view games as an ongoing uh, engagement with the consumer, not a static uh, product. You're now uh, seeing uh, uh, things like stream movies and other content over gaming systems. 40% of the time on the Xbox Live is spent not gaming. Which is, which is pretty remarkable. So these, these devices that, that started as things on which you could play Pong have now grown into the, 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 the new set-top box for, for the American worldwide uh, living room. And user-generated content is, is something that we see in a number of games, and we look forward to, 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 to that exploding. Um, I want to turn a little bit to some of the public-private partnerships that, that we do and have done and participated uh, in with uh, the support of, of uh, this White House and policymakers in the Obama administration. This administration has been uh, visionary in terms of the, the engagement and the potential of this technology and uh, folks like uh, from the president on down to Anish Chopra, the, the, the former uh, CTO of the federal government, Tom Khalil, Kumar Garg, Constance, uh, and, and others, Ari Matusiak, Greg Nelson, they have understood that this is an amazing new platform and, and it has a tremendous potential and we ought to uh, uh, engage uh, together to form some partnerships. So we've done just that. And uh, back to the, the Gaming Guild, because this is just so fascinating. It's such an amazing success story uh, uh, that, that you guys have all sort of individually arrived at the conclusion that the, the federal government can uh, uh, tap into this, this uh, the amazing wellspring of creativity to help bring your information out there, to help uh, achieve your objectives. And, and you know, with Constance, our uh, uh, effort to, to bring everybody together, and we're thrilled that, that, that so many of you are here today. I was thinking a little bit about the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, and the last scene where they have the Ark of the Covenant, and they take this amazing, this amazing ark, this, uh, this artifact, and they put it in a crate, and they take it down in the middle of this warehouse and put it up on a stack and the camera zooms back and there are a million other crates that look just like that. And I think sometimes that's what the federal database is like. That's, the federal government is, in, is really good at, at gathering data uh, and, and, and it's astonishing. The challenge, and the government's good about it in terms of, of, of digesting that data and putting it out to the public, the challenge is going to be how to make it more engaging. And that's something that, that we uh, have energetically worked with the federal government to see uh, if our industry can help uh, in, in, in that regard, to take those arcs of the covenant that you have out there, whether it's data on the food pyramid, whether it's data on traffic, whether it's homeland security assistance, that we can help through the gamification process to engage. 
engage because what we realize with our consumers is you have to meet them where they are. You have to uh, present what you're presenting in an interesting way because at the end of the day, what we have to present are just a bunch of ones and zeros and blips and, and dots on the screen. We happen to be expert in, in assembling that all together in a narrative way and, and making that, uh, making that uh, available to the, to the consumer. Uh, so what have we done? In the past, we've, uh, what we did is we said, okay, we're, we're good at one thing. We're not a foundation, we're not the government, we're not a nonprofit, but we're really good at designing games, or at least our member companies are good at designing games. So we partnered with the right people. Um, we partnered with uh, the MacArthur Foundation on Game Changers, and we said, what if we uh, design some levels in existing games that taught kids STEM learning? And we had a contest around those games. So uh, our, our uh, member company, Sony, opened up the source code for Little Big Planet 2, which is an amazing game, one game of the year a couple years back, and said we will allow people to go in there and tinker and, and create new levels that can engage kids on STEM learning. EA uh, and, and Will Wright and the Spore team opened up the dev code for Spore and said let's allow people to go in and design some STEM levels. And it was, it was remarkable. We had uh, a tremendous amount of engagement and we got some great games out of that. So I think there's a lesson there that if you choose your partners right, you know, you've got three days here at, at Games for Change with some of the brightest minds in the, these spaces. You've got some of the brightest minds in game design, some of the brightest minds in social uh, gaming and games for impact, some of, some of the brightest uh, minds in, in the federal government, some of the brightest minds in, in the foundation and nonprofit space. Partner well, partner with people that can help you with your advantages. Another partnership that we did through uh, the, the leadership of the White House was with the Department of Agriculture. They said, we've got this food pyramid, we've got all this amazing data about what Americans eat, what they shouldn't eat, what they should eat, but we know what they eat and how much they eat it, and caloric count, content with bushels of corn, we, we've got all that. We have no way to present this in a way that's manageable. So they, um, and, and Anish and, and others in the, in the uh, federal government said, we're going to open up all of this data. And, and we engage with them to do the Apps for Healthy Kids Challenge, where we uh, engage kids to design games, video games or other games, around this data. Take all this data relating to food and help get kids uh, eating healthier. We had some tremendous games that came out of this. Some uh, games at the collegiate level, some games at the professional level, and also some kids who, who designed games. Some turned in completed games. Others just turned in sketches of what the games could be. But what it showed was that people were willing to engage with this boring, voluminous mass of government data and make it cool and hip and engaging and interesting. And that's the special sauce that we as an industry uh, can add because at the end of the day, when you speak to people in our industry, they truly believe in the transformative power of this technology. They are in this industry because they think this technology, video game technology, has the power to change the world. So another thing that we've done uh, is the uh, annual Games and Learning Roundtable. E3 is this amazing uh, congregation of people in our industry. It's our industry trade show. It happens in Los Angeles every year. 45,000 people a day come in and they see what's coming next. We wanted to capture the excitement that's around that and all of the expertise that's inherent to that and then invite some very, very smart people from the foundation world as well as the government world. So we've had it uh, three years in a row. Constance was the keynote speaker this year. Ari Matusiak from the White House spoke. Last year, uh, Mike Stratmanis from the White House spoke as our keynote speaker. The year before that it was Anish Chopra. So again, we have engagement with people who can help us uh, and we can help them. Uh, and we formed some tremendous partnerships. Again, we have officials from the White House, Joan Gans Cooney Center at Sesame Workshop, NASA, California Endowment, MacArthur, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, AMD, Institute of Play, uh, Konami, EA, uh, Sony, and, and Ubisoft, and, and others. And they all get together, and we just riff, and we brainstorm, and we've had some amazing ideas in just two years come out of this. And we really adopt the Clinton Global Initiative uh, uh, mod mantra, which is we're not here just to talk, we're here to do, and if we come back a year from now we haven't done anything cool and interesting, then we're just going to stop this all, all together. So here's what we've been doing. Um, the Active Play Challenge, we, one of the, the problems we, we 
set out to solve was uh, the obesity crisis. What can we do uh, to help engage kids and get them and their families up and moving? And now that we have these tremendous leaps forward in technology with the Microsoft Connect, with the PlayStation Move, and with the Wii, you can actually get kids off of the couch and engage them where they are and make it fun and interesting for them to, to exercise. So we said, well, who knows about this? The President's Council on Sports, Fitness, and Nutrition. And we, we uh, designed this program where, uh, do you remember when you were growing up, the President's Challenge with the straight leg sit-ups and the Ben Armour? Right? You can now get that badge through active video game play. And what's, what's amazing about this is we're able to reach a demographic much broader than just the jocks and the kids who, 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 who letter in, in sports. You're able to get um, girls who are interested in cheerleading. You're able to get the chess club kids. You're able to get a lot of different kids because you're giving them a different vehicle to get active. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how they get active, it's, it's that they get active. And Shelley Fall in the President's Council, along with Secretary of uh, Health and Human uh, Services Sebelius, who you see pictured there, and Dominique Dawes and Michelle Kwan and Drew Brees and Billie Jean King, we all got together and launched this uh, in, in D.C. And it's up on the President's Council website, and you or any, any, any kid you know can go and, and, and get your, your PALA uh, award. It's not just for kids anymore. Adults can get their PALA uh, award as well. And we're thrilled to be involved uh, in, in, involved about in, in that. Uh, two more examples, and then I'm going to wrap up with a video and then open it up for, for, for questions. When we were at E3 last year, um, <coughs> Mike Stramanis uh, at the White House said, my favorite game is SSX. You mind, can we go by there? And when we went by, we talked to the SSX development team. They said, here's something cool that we're doing. We took all this NASA mapping data and we dropped it into our program. We've, we've got a... Um, We've got a game mechanic. We, we, we've got a, an engine that we can drop this into, and you can now snowboard Mount Everest. You can snowboard Kilimanjaro. You can snowboard Pikes Peak, Mount McKinley, anything you want to do. It's real time, and you know it looks exactly like it would look if you were snow, you know, snowboarding K2. And um, it was an aha moment because the, you know, this is not something we arranged. The, the EAA guys uh, figured they'd heard about this, this data share program and said, this is cool. I bet there's some cool stuff out there and just took it and dropped it in. The, the White House folks said, wow, this is an amazing real world example of, of somebody taking our data that we just released, that's raw data, and, 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 and using it uh, in, in, in a way that's, that's engaging for people. So we're thrilled. That game is out. It's fun. It's, it's really cool to play, and we're looking forward to additional uh, uh, partnerships with, with people like NASA. We had the NASA folks out at E3 this year, and they talked about uh, bir Angry Birds in Space, which they worked with. Uh, and uh, there are a whole range of things that, that NASA is doing on the gamification front, as, as many of, of you know. Um, and lastly, wanted to, I want to talk about something that we're, we're particularly proud of at, at, at ESA and something that it's in its second year, it, it already seems like an institution. It's this, um, the National STEM Video Game Challenge. It was inspired by President Obama and the Educate to in, uh, Innovate initiative announced by the President. Uh, and we make available a total of $80,000 in prizes and we award them to, to kids and to teachers and to college kids and to professional uh, developers to design video games around, uh, around STEM. And, and what's, what's really fascinating, again, we teamed with people who are better at this than we are. Uh, because at the end of the day, I'm just a lobbyist. At the end of the day, we're just a trade association. But we can bring some of our powers to be uh, and, and, and join forces with uh, some amazing partners, Eli Media, AMD, Joan Gans Cooney Center at Sesame Workshop, uh, Microsoft, uh, the Corporation for Public Broad Broadcasting, uh, PBS, Ready to Learn. And then we team with the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts and the Boys and Girls Clubs uh, of America. And, and we te team with Brain Pop, people with reach into elementary schools and middle schools and high schools to tell kids, hey, you can enter this contest. And what we saw was this year, as you'll see in the video, um, th we went from 600 entries in the first year to 3,700 uh, entries this year. So it, it, it was a... Um, I don't know, 600% increase, and we hope to grow it even more. And the, the kids that, that uh, they, we brought them to Washington, they got to, uh, the Atlantic does an, an Innovations in Education annual seminar. They got to meet all the other winners, uh, 28 different winners. They got to meet people from the White House. They got to meet congressmen, and people came by and played their games. And that's incredibly uh, uh, empowering for, for, for these kids. It's, in, in, it's incredibly empowering for their parents and for their students. Because if you go into, a, uh, and I'll close with this, if you go into a class room today and we've, we, we, we've got uh, some folks here from Global Lawyer who are really expert at, at this, Amber and Adit and her whole team, and you ask kids 
what do you want to do when you grow up? I mean, maybe other than professional sports star or rock star, hip hop star, it, every hand goes up with, would you like to make video games when you grow up? And, and when that hand goes up, it shows that these kids are really engaged, not just as consumers, but they also want to be creators. If you give them the tools to be creators, if you, you, you're not only engaging them on core, uh, curriculum uh, subjects like, like STEM, you're also giving them the tools they need for 20th, 21st century uh, skill sets. And the 21st century creative economy. You're teaching them how to work creatively and collaboratively. You're teaching them about systems thinking, about uh, analytics and, and, and looking at things through critical analysis. Uh, you're teaching them to, to collaborate the way that we collaborate and putting together a lot of these par partnerships. So we're thrilled to be part of, of this dialogue here at Games for Change. We're thrilled to be part of these partnerships and we're always looking as an industry for more partnerships. Um, on the Ed Sullivan Show, they said never follow animals or children. So uh, I'm going to show a video of the kid winners, uh, and so I'll close uh, my remarks here. Uh, I'll, I'll let the kids close it out, and then if we have time for, for a, uh, uh, a question or two. Thank you very much. It's young people like you that make me so confident that his best days are still to come. I live in San Antonio, Texas, and I'm a seventh grade. I'm Amukola. I'm Maddie Laporta. And I'm Chloe Mario. And, and we're from Stuart Country Day School in Princeton, New Jersey. Aside from programming and designing video games, I like to play chess, across and judo. I also enjoy creating pieces of art. The main way I found out about this competition was through my mother. I had already been working on Pat Fiction Wars for a long time. One of the librarians at my school told me no, that I was working on a scientific educational game and it turned out to be the perfect competition for me to enter it. It's bringing kids together who are excited about the development of video games. Something they can make a real career out of is very exciting. Gaming is a great way to convey that type of learning to children who maybe wouldn't necessarily respond to STEM in more traditional settings. I designed this game for young people to learn multiplication and division in a fun way. The character moves around by manipulating the attractive and repulsive forces in the average. Oh, look at all the cute fish! The way we learned inequality when we were younger was with a shark mouth, and the shark wanted to eat the larger number. Ah! So that's what we designed our game after. Yeah! <laughs> I'm smarter than a first grader. Most of my games, I don't have goals. All my games are just for me to learn. It's just natural learning that's going to happen in the course of following some interested in, which is really the best way to learn. I guess I had the idea of a bottle ring, so I had to get through a recycling but everybody pitched in. Carter came up with the idea for the game. We got the idea of putting Justin in there because we've seen him draw stuff. As a parent, I know seeing your kids do extraordinary things brings the greatest happiness that a parent can have. My family tested my game, gave me feedback. My little brother was my main tester. He supported me and played and tested my entire game. Our teacher, Miss Testa, approached us and told us that she saw a lot of potential in the shark idea. I think it was a really new experience for all of us because we never ventured out into doing something like that. 
I think I'll take some more computer programming classes in high school, but I actually find it really interesting now that I tried it. I'm very interested in being a writer. In the future, I'd like to own my own game company. I will probably pursue a job in computer science, engineering, or theoretical physics. When you work and study and excel at what you're doing in math and science, we're making sure we have the best, smartest, most skilled workers in the world. The second point, we'll bring that up with uh, with some of our partners and remedy that because we definitely want this to be inter interactive. And on, on the first point, um, first of all, I want to uh, uh, sort of salute you and everybody else in this room for your vision and your audacity because you guys are definitely on the cutting edge. I'm sure that whether you're in the government or whether you're a teacher or uh, in whatever field, when you say, "Yeah, I'm really going to go into the, uh, the, the talk about video games." and how video games can have serious impact. People sort of constantly, and I've talked about this, they look at you like, you know, kind of like, you know, His Majesty's voice, you know, they kind of do that dog tilt thing. Like, really? Video games? Oh, that's great. Good luck with that. Uh, and, 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 you, and you sort of have to get over that, that hump of convincing people that, that there's serious thought. But, but what, what we're finding is that there's a real ecosystem. We, we're seeing it over these three days, developing around games and learning and, and assessment. And there's some serious academic research and support going on uh, for that. We try as an industry to, to sort of bring that to the fore and work with our various partners. Uh, I'm not at liberty to say, but next week you're going to hear two uh, very major announcements in uh, regards to w what you were talking about, about taking existing amazing games and building uh, new levels for learning around the core curriculum there. Uh, one's going to come at the Aspen Institute and, and, and one's going to come next week in California as well. Two separate. One, one is going to uh, help kids design their own games. One's going to bring together the best people in learning and assessment and academia with the best designers in the world to create games that are, that are, that are engaging. So watch this space. It's, it's, it's very interesting. But thank you. Thank you for the question. <coughs>